Amen, amen. Thank you, Pastor Tanya. I am excited to be here with you all today. You know, I think I realized just now as you were speaking that part of the reason um, that you perceived me as warm was because it's always so cold in Michigan. <laughs> that might be it. I always tell the story. People were asking me from my church, oh, who do you know at, at Laguna Niguel? And I said, oh, Pastor Tanya, we went to seminary together. And I always tell the story because I remember getting out of my car, and in my mind it was blizzarding, like the wind was blowing, it was snowing in my face, I was trying to wipe my glasses off, and I heard a voice in the distance, and it was Rico, and I'm like, who is this? I don't, nobody knows me here. And I look up and it's Tanya. I had no idea that you were there. And uh, I think that's why, because we were in the middle of a blizzard. So I was, uh, I, I probably seemed warm. <laughs> so uh, I do uh, bring you greetings from Relove Church. Thank you, uh, Pastor Tanya and your team here um, for the opportunity to come and share. Um, I was greeted warmly when I came in today. And I can say with confidence that's not the case for every church. So I'm grateful for all of you being so receptive uh, to the people that come in your doors. And we know for a fact that that's because of the love of Jesus that you have in your heart. I'm excited just to share a word um, with you all today called Unexpected Spaces. I want to jump right in, if you don't mind. Uh, and I want to read from the book of Acts in chapter 16. And I did not give this scripture actually to the team, so I'm just going to read um, in your hearing. Uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 6, it said that Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Verse 7 says, when they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to, would not allow them to. You just bear with me this morning as we speak from the topic, unexpected spaces. God, we're grateful for the opportunity to be uh, here in the house of the Lord. Uh, speak through me. Uh, remove any uh, areas of unclarity so that as people leave this place today, It'll be clear to them that you have, in fact, visited them here in this space. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I think we live our life often with expectation. Expectation really is the anticipation of something happening, right? Expectation is the way that we navigate through the A's, B's, and C's of life, expecting the X, Y's, and Z's. We wake up in the morning and get ready because we have a plan for the day, we have a schedule, we have places to be, things that we intend to achieve, and when things get in the way of that, what happens? We typically are uh, disgruntled, we are discouraged, some of us may become angry or frustrated. Why? Because we have expectations. And as a person who has expectations, it can often feel just that way. When your expectations don't come to fruition, when what you planned for the day, when something infringes upon your ability to, to complete your plan. How many of you can, can feel that? How many of you have felt that or can relate? Yeah, I think there's something as a Christian as well about the Christian life and being a believer, especially as Seventh-day Adventists, we have a life of expectation. Our faith is one of expectation. We are Advent. So we re believe in the return of Jesus Christ, the second coming, which is something we are expecting, right? So I think that the idea of expectation is a good one. I don't want to, to, to disregard the power of living a life of expectation, but I also want to put it into context a little bit today because I believe that expectations can become dangerous when they are unsurrendered expectations, so you should wake up in the morning with a plan and an intention. You should have a, a goal that you set. But if those plans and intentions, schedules and goals are not surrendered to the God that you're doing them for, then I think they can become inhibitive. And here in Acts chapter 16, we see Paul and Silas traveling. And in verse 6 and 7, like we read just now, we see that Paul and Silas expected to take the gospel into Asia. But their expectation was met by a closed door. And what I want to do is I want to travel through, we're going to read a little, uh, quite a bit of, of scripture in, in chapter 16 of the book of Acts today. And so I, I, I hope you can follow along. But what is what I want to take a look at is in Acts chapter 16, we see three different spaces that Paul and Silas encounter, all three of which they had to surrender their expectations. And I want to, for the purposes of this 
sermon today call those spaces. So these are spaces where two people are encountering one another, at least two people, right? And we know as Christians also that in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, there's a promise that Jesus made to his disciples, and that is that where two or three are gathered, I will be with you as well. So I want to bring to the forefront of all of your minds the power that you have in connection, in fellowship with one another, and as a Christian, being the body that the Holy Spirit lives in, the power that you have when you enter into a space, you are bringing with you the Holy Spirit, and there is a power in that. Uh, let's pick it up. Let's pick the story up, though, in Acts chapter 16, verse 13, okay? So we have the context set. Paul and Silas expected to go into Asia, but the Holy Spirit closed the door on that, redirected them to the city of Philippi, which is what we see here. Uh, in verse 13 of chapter 16, it says, On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gates to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. Someone say expected. We sat down and began to speak to the woman who had gathered there. The women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. This part of scripture is the first example of an unexpected space that Paul and Silas found themselves in. Again, they expected to enter into the city of Philippi to find a place of prayer, but rather they found a group of women who were talking by the river. And I just want to take a quick moment in honor of International Women's Month to elevate what we're seeing here. The fact that there were a group of women in the front of the city who were gathering is an indicator that there was likely not a synagogue in the city of Philippi. And as the story continues and we see through scripture that we know there was not a church yet. That's why Paul and Silas were redirected there. But what we recognize is because there were women at the gate of the city who were gathering, there was likely not a synagogue in that place. Because if there was, there would have been at least six men or more who were able to have that synagogue started. Because in Hebrew culture at that time, you needed at least six men in order to have a synagogue. So what we see is they enter into a space, Paul and Silas, and they, they, they meet by, they encounter these group of women who are, who are, who are worshiping together. And I want to elevate this concept of conversational evangelism, because I think typically what we believe often is that we need to have very great programs. We need to, we need to have all of this um, teaching and this knowledge. If I didn't go to school to learn the scriptures, I can't be a minister to the people that I encounter. But that's false. I want you guys to recognize that what it does not say in Acts chapter 16, verse 13 through 15, is that Paul and Silas preached to the women. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that Paul and Silas gave Bible studies to the women. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that, that, that Paul and Silas exegeted scripture or prophesied to the women. All it does, it says that they sat down and spoke to the women. I want all of you to recognize the power you have simply in your ability to communicate. Amen. Simply as a Christian, you have a power in your ability to experience conversation with another person. So I, right now, in the name of Christ, want to deny any spirit of doubt in you, any spirit of, 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 of inferiority, any spirit of, of um, a, a personal uh, uh, feelings of disqualification that you may have as a person because you feel like you may not be qualified. We see through Paul and Silas in their ministry, there's a power simply in their conversation. But now I want to ask, how willing are you to talk to strangers? How willing are you to share spaces with people? We see their willingness here. In verse 14, it says, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. It doesn't say that Paul opened her heart. It doesn't say that Paul did a work in her. No, the Lord did a work in her. The Spirit did a work in her. I want to remind you that conviction of a person's heart is the work of the Spirit. It is not the work of the instrument. We are simply the instrument. In the hearts of those around you, there are seeds waiting to be watered by your conversation. 
You don't need to bring a Bible verse. You don't need to bring a prayer. You, you meet someone in the, in, in the coffee shop or you're in the break room. All you need to do from what we see here is allow yourself the space to encounter another person and be willing to connect with them conversationally. And the Spirit does the rest of the work. Verse 15 says that the space Lydia experienced with Paul and Silas, she sought, in verse 15, what we see is, is that she sought to re-experience what she had with Paul and Silas. In verse 15, we see that she says when her when she had the members of her household, when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. And if you consider me to be a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. So what we see Lydia do here, we see Lydia has experienced conversation with Paul and Silas. And now, as a result of that conversation, she is duplicating what she experienced with Paul and Silas in her home. And we see this all throughout the New Testament. There's something to be said about large group worship and small group gathering, right? So we see all, that's the way the church started in the book of Acts. Post-resurrection of Christ, we see that the apostles and the disciples were going and beginning churches in people's homes. So I want to ask you as a Christian, how are you recreating the experience you have had with Christ in your home, in your personal spaces, yeah? There's, 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 there's not a, 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 a lot that, that Paul and Silas did with this. You see, all the work was done by the Spirit here. In verse 3, it says that they expected to find a place of prayer. And sometimes I feel like we miss blessings, and we miss the blessings that we can give other people because of our unwillingness and, and our, our closed-offness to be used by God when he's calling us to be flexible. Amen. We see that they were intending to go into Asia. But what we recognize is that the Holy Spirit redirected them, and we see very clearly there's a purpose here. Because in the conversation they experienced with this woman, there was transformation that took place in her heart. No one comes to God alone. I don't know what your story is or how you came to Christ or came to be a believer, but I would venture to guess that God used other people in your life to help bring you to a place of surrender. When you pursue him, God will place in your path the people that he actually wants you to connect with. If Paul and Silas would have been so rigidly connected to their expectations to take the gospel to Asia, this woman may never have experienced that, that conversion. So I just want to ask you and your expectations for the ministry that God has in your life. How are you releasing that to the one you're doing it for? And we typically get so caught up in the work that we want to do as a Christian and, and, and the work we want to do for our father that we forget to be a son. We forget to be a daughter who is taught, directed, and instructed by the father. We see Paul and Silas were very willing this first point, I just want all of you to take away from what we just said, and it is that when you make space for conversation, God makes space for transformation. In your willingness to be a human being with other people and simply communicate, God can do a work through you in the life of another person. We're going to move on. We're going to move on to the next part um, of Acts chapter 16. We're picking it up in verse 16. It says, once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days, and finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. Yeah, so what do we see here? What do we see? Uh, what, what we see here in this scripture is a different type of space that was experienced. If we as Christians could have all of our encounters with people end up like Lydia, with conversion, and now I want you to come to my house, that would be great. But that's not the reality of life. 
Although God can create transformation through your conversation, we see a different type of space here. Here we see confrontation. We see a confrontational space. What we know about this when we look deeper into, into the, the, the Greek about this is that what the woman was, what the, what the female slave was doing was she was not professing the truth of these men, although what she said is true. She was taunting them. She was following Paul and Silas as they traveled through the city of Philippi and, 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 and taunting them. It was her, her words were, were not professions of faith. Her words when she said, you know, these men are going around and telling you how to live. What she was doing was announcing to the city, hey, these guys are disrupting what's going on here. What she was doing was, was, was actually something that we know was against what Paul and Silas wanted because the scripture in verse 16 says that Paul became so annoyed, he got fed up with it, that he turned around after three days of enduring this. How many of us are sitting with our confrontational relationships for three days? And I'm going to say something about that because there is something to be said about your spiritual maturity in your long suffering with confrontation. There is something to be said about the fruit of the spirit that is in you when you are able to suffer long in and through confrontation. I want you to think about the relationships you have with your spouses, your husbands, your wives, your kids, the people that work, your supervisor, the person that gets on your very last nerve. <laughs> How long are you suffering through that type of confrontation? Your ability to suffer through confrontation is, in fact, an indicator of your spiritual maturity. But the truth is, so many of us in our communication styles are conflict avoidant. We're not going to be ready and willing just to jump into confrontation thinking that there's going to be something good on the other side. Again, remember, we're talking about connection. We're talking about human connection. People-pleasing behavior that arises from deep-rooted fear of upsetting others is shown in your conflict avoidance. I'm going to say it again. Conflict avoidance is actually people-pleasing behavior that arises from a deep-rooted fear that you're going to upset another person. We're talking about a confrontational space with this woman, Paul and Silas. And I want to ask... How are you in your relationships allowing yourself to be used by God through spaces of confrontation to be a light in the life of another person? Human connection often is not nice and Lydia-like. Sitting by the river in a peaceful moment of prayer, that's not always what our experiences as humans is going to look like. We have to be willing to understand the value of connection even in those difficult spaces, even in those confrontational spaces? Who in your life is standing in the need of the healing that the Holy Spirit wants to deliver to them through you? Who in your life is standing in the need of a healing that the Holy Spirit wants to deliver through your willingness to be used even through conflict? We see this woman as she was a slave, she was, she was, she was slaved, she was bound twice. She was possessed and she was a slave. So she was physically captive and she was spiritually captive. And there's a word in that because some of us are looking at the physical surroundings that we're in and relegating those only to physical circumstances when there's truly a spiritual undergirding with some of the physical experiences that we are bound by. But we see this woman who has brought conflict to them, but where Paul and Cyrus were open to, uh, to, to experience, where Paul and Silas created confrontation, God created space for restoration. This woman, as a result of their encounter with Paul and Silas, was healed. She was restored. Because Paul, and, Paul has called the spirit out of her. There is a healing in some of the confrontational situations that we find ourselves in. We look at Galatians 5, what do we see? We see the fruit of the spirit. We see love, joy, and peace. We see patience and kindness, generosity, faithfulness, 
gentleness. I want to ask you as a Christian, are you a Christian only because you're coming to church on Sabbath? Are you a Christian only because you're listening to Christian radio on your way to work, but as soon as you step into the threshold of your work, you don't want nothing to do with no one in there? How are we really acting in our Christianity? How is our Christianity influencing the lives of those around us? I really want to, to challenge that question. How do people know you're a Christian? And sometimes if we're not willing to sit in the conflict and be used by God in moments for God to do something in the lives of those around us, it's not always that evident. But I don't want to just make it about the people around you because the truth is it's not just the people around you that God wants to do something in. Guess what? God wants to do something in you as well. And sometimes in the work that God is calling you to do for others, he must first do in you. And in these spaces of conflict, that's where we see him do that the most. We find ourselves being molded and formed by the environments that we are around. And God can do a, a molding and forming work in our heart and in our spirit when we are sitting in these places of confrontation. When you create space for confrontation, God creates space for restoration. We saw in the first situation with Lydia that there was a space that was created, a connection that was created, and where you create space for conversation, God will create space for transformation. And this, we see that when you create space for confrontation, God creates space for restoration. We're going to move on to the third point. And our third point, though, is that when you create space for complication, God can create space for liberation. Let's continue to look at what Acts chapter 16 has to share with us. We're picking up the story now in verse 19. In verse 19, it says, when her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace, for, marketplace to face the authorities. Verse 20, they brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Verse 22 says, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. The jailer commanded the guard, the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. But midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Verse 27, the jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for the lights and rushed in, fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? This is a powerful story. I don't know if you've ever read Acts chapter 16 straight through as a book, but we see them enter into the, Philippi, into the city of Philippi after being redirected. Then we see after that, uh, they, they meet Lydia. After they meet Lydia, they see the encounter with the female slave, right? So we're, we see back-to-back -back encounters and encounters and encounters. And now, the space that they're in is a very complicated one. Because what is actually happening here is that the city is, has attacked and beaten Paul and Silas as a result of them healing the female slave. And I want to ask you again as a Christian, how are you disrupting the status quo of the spaces you're entering into? We weren't called to a comfortable life as Christians. Paul and Silas actually had to suffer as a result of their commitment and conviction for the calling over their life. So they're now in a very complicated space. I mean, it doesn't get any more complicated than that. They, they wanted to go to Asia, door shut on them there. So now they go to Philippi, they meet Lydia, that's cool. After they meet Lydia, they, they had the situation with the female slave. Now they're beaten, stripped, stripped first, beaten with rods, they are flogged, their backs are bloody, now they're in prison, it's close to the midnight hour, their hands and feet are in stocks, this is what the scripture says. I don't know when the last time you went through all that was, but it's probably unlikely, it's 
Maybe some of you did. But the truth is, on a day-to-day basis, these are not the type of complications that we experience. But Paul and Silas now find themselves in a very complicated space. But this is what I want to pull from this part of the scripture when we're talking about connecting with people. In, Acts, in, 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 in verse 24, it says that the jailer did, in verse 24, I'm going to read this for you one more time. In verse 24, it says, when he received these orders, this is the jailer, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. In that very scripture, we see that the, the jailer had one job, to keep these men locked up. And the jailer did one thing right, And the jailer did one thing wrong. What did he do right? Let's just look at that. Verse 24. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. Sounds like he did his job. He put them in the inner cell. He fastened their feet with stocks. But he did something wrong, according to verse 24. Something that allowed them to escape from prison. Verse 24, what does it say he did? This is, what, this is what he did right. This is what he did wrong. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell. He put them in the inner cell. See, this is where the jailer messed up. See, because he had the audacity to place two believing men of God in the same place. This jailer had the nerve to think that where two or more are gathered, that the Holy Spirit wouldn't be there. This jailer had the audacity to place these two believing men of God in the same cell. I want to tell you something today, church family. The enemy does not want to fight you when you're with your brothers and sisters. The enemy does not want to fight you when you're in fellowship with one another. The enemy does not want to fight you when you are in agreement with one another. The enemy wants to fight you when you are alone. And we live in a society today... Where we were just starting to recognize the truth and the gravity behind circumstances of mental health. But I'm going to tell you with anxiety, depression, suicidality, the number one factor that is a commonality among all of them is isolation. If that jailer truly wanted to do his job, he never should have let those two faith-filled, called, convicted, believing men of God to stay in the same place. Because why? 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 What do we see is that in verse 25, that they began praying and singing hymns. They began praying and singing hymns. So their hands are are, are locked and their feet are locked in stocks. They can't move. They can't run away. They can't escape. They can't continue their mission for Christ. But guess what wasn't locked? Their mouths. (laughs) And if that guy really didn't want them... To escape from prison, he should have put a muzzle on them. Because although they were locked and in prison, they still knew scripture. They still knew the hymns that they used to sing on Sabbath. They knew that there was a power greater than the jailer. They still knew their psalms. Verse 46, for God is my refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not I fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. They had committed to memory scripture that carried them through their complicated situations. And when they were together, they could capitalize on one another's faith to find themselves in a place where God could have power through their prison. Listen, where one of us is suffering, we should not be alone. If you are in a place of pain, if you are finding yourself in a prison, you should not be alone. We have twofold responsibility as brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to notice when people stop coming to church. Give that person a call. But the onus is not only on the people that are still coming to church. The onus is on you as well. If you find yourself in a prison, reach out. Reach out to your brothers and sisters. Because there's a true power in the connectivity that we have with one another. I don't know how many of you all are familiar with the study that they did um, with monkeys. There were two, uh, they would place monkeys in cages and they wanted to measure the cortisol levels. And cortisol is the hormone um, that is responsive to fear. And so in, in wanting to measure these cortisol levels, they would place monkeys in separate cages and then they would begin to engage a series of sensory stimuli. So they would flash bright lights, loud sounds, they would rattle the cage, and then they would measure the level of cortisol that would raise in the monkeys' bodies. The truth was, when the monkeys were in separate cages, the level of cortisol was double what it was when the, they were in the cages together. There is a true value in your connectivity with one another. 
Look to your neighbor and say, be my monkey. <laughs> be my monkey. I need a monkey. You got to have a monkey. This Christian journey was never one intended to walk alone. And as we're talking about human connection and our ability to evangelize and, and meet other people where they are, how are you staying connected with the fellowship? Because through their connectivity, through their togetherness, they could pray, they could sing, they had each other's faith. They had a change of perspective through being locked up together. And your perspective can either be your prison or it can be your passport. It can be your prison for where you are or it can be the passport where, for where God is trying to take you. And when you are connected with people with whom God, if you are connected to people with whom you share God's plan, you will learn to recognize your problems as pathways to purpose. You will learn through the reflection of the brotherhood and the sisterhood of those around you that, hey, we're in this together. There's something this person has in their perspective that I don't. There's something that my husband or wife can bring to my mind that I'm not thinking of when I'm at my low points because there is a power in your connection there's also a power in their ability and willingness to suffer through that complicated situation. Because again, when you create space for complication, God creates space for liberation. God uses the complicated spaces in your life to set you free. And he uses the complicated spaces you share with others to set free those around you. See, because we know that they were broken out of prison because of what? Lightning? That's not what the word says. A tornado came through, busted the walls? That's not what the word says. But the jailer was so convicted by their beautiful harmonies <laughs> that he decided to unlock them? That's not what the word says. The word says that they escaped from prison because the ground beneath them shook. It says that there was an earthquake. And many of you in your life may be experiencing an earthquake around you. You may feel instability in your relationship, instability in your financial situation, instability in your faith or connection with God, where things around you are kind of shaky. Circumstances that you've invested in did not turn out the way you expected. But sometimes God is going to shake the earth around you, not just to set you free, but to set free the people who are in prison around you as well. Sometimes your prison isn't just about your circumstances. Sometimes your prison isn't just because God is neglecting you. Sometimes your prison isn't just because you're a victim. Sometimes your, your prison has nothing to do with you. Sometimes your battle is to fortify the faith of the person watching you go through it. These prisoners, as a result of these men's faith, as a result of these men's togetherness, and as a result of the earthquake around them that shattered the walls and the prisons and the chains, not only were they set free, but everybody in the prison around them was set free. When you create space for complication, God will create space for liberation. We see freedom where the spirit is. And in Matthew 20, verse 18, we see that God promises to be there and that the spirit will be in your connection with other people. As I come to a close, I just want to bring to your realization uh, the power of the impact, the lasting years of impact that these three spaces had, even in your world today. As a result of the earth shaking and these prisoners being set free, this jailer went to kill himself, it says in the scripture. Paul said, stop, don't, we're all here, don't kill yourself. Then the scripture goes on to explain that that jailer then asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And what we see now is that this jailer takes Paul and Silas to his home, and at his home it says he cleaned their wounds, and he sat with them and their family. And just like Lydia, what happened to this jailer? This jailer gave his life to God. Follow with me. Not only did this jailer, but his family gave his life to God. So just like Lydia's home that was opened up for God to create more spaces in, the jailer's home was opened up for God to create more spaces. I'm going somewhere. So this wasn't just an isolated situation that happened thousands of years ago that has nothing, nothing to do with us. Part of the reason your church here exists, part of the reason my church exists, is because of this experience. Because what we, learn, what, we, what we learn later on as we read through the book of Acts, that, that it is actually through the jailer that the church in Philippi was created. Remember, 
They entered into the city, and the women were there. There was no church. There was no synagogue. Remember, they planned to go to Asia, and God closed that door and said, no, you're going to go to Philippi. Why? Because there was no church set there yet. So as a result of these men's faith and their obedience and long-suffering through these complicated situations, what happens? They set free the jailer who then opened his home to begin the church of Philippi. Guess what we have today as a result of the church of Philippi? We have the book of Philippians. I don't know what your faith journey would be like without the book of Philippians, but I can tell you without the book of Philippians for me, I would not know Philippians 4.13 that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because the book of Philippians was written by Paul to the people in Philippi, to the church in Philippi that was started through this jailer. So as a Christian, if you didn't have the book of Philippi, you wouldn't know that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You wouldn't know not to be anxious for anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, present your request to God. Philippians 4, 6. You wouldn't know that. You wouldn't know that he who's begun a good work in you will be faithful to carry it out through the completion until the day of Christ. Philippians 1, 6. We would not have the book of Philippians if it wasn't for the church of Philippi. We would not have the church of Philippi if it wasn't for the jailer. We wouldn't have the jailer if it wasn't for Paul and Cyrus experiencing these three difficult spaces. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the opportunity today to proclaim your word, to proclaim the hope that exists in our connectivity with one another. Father, as we as brothers and sisters in fellowship uh, live life one with another, God, I pray that we do so in a way that edifies your kingdom, but also in a way that glorifies your word, in a way that grows your church, God. I know that day-to-day -day life can be a struggle for all of those under the sound of my voice. Many of us are suffering hardships that are unspoken. I don't want to diminish those, God, but I pray that you elevate people's perspectives in their prisons. I pray, God, that you, you, you fortify the faith of those who are suffering through confrontation or complication. Uh, Father, I pray that you enliven and embolden those who need to be open simply to experience conversation with those around us. You want to do a good work around us, God, but you got to start with the work that you want to do in us. And we are surrendering that to you today. In Jesus' name, amen.